the big picture is we found in, in chapter 6 of Revelation the rider on the white horse is huge. It's not just a little blip. This is God introducing us to the final phase of human history. This rider on the white horse is an influence which John the Apostle calls the spirit of the Antichrist who becomes a person, embodiment of the devil called the Antichrist or the beast. And he is the worst human who ever lives. He's a real person. He is someone that Satan has always wanted to have allowed by God to be in power. I, I've shared this uh, many times. I believe Satan has had an antichrist. Uh, I, I think Nimrod back at the Tower of Babel was, was an antichrist with a small a. Someone that was really doing Satan's bidding. But God has always suppressed those who Satan has wanted to conquer the world. See, the Antichrist is a person who finally does what all humans have wanted. He unites all humans across all ethnic, racial, uh, language, religious barriers, socioeconomic. He finally unites the whole world. And there's one, as it were, king of the world, of humans. And he's a human. And he's the worst human whoever lives. And we bump into him right here in chapter 7. Well, the, the lesson that we learn from the scriptures is that this man, we first bumped into him in Revelation 6 and 13. He's the false peacemaking rider on the white horse, or as you see, oh, let me get once more because that doesn't show me what you're seeing. Uh, he's called the beast in chapter 13. He's the rider on the white horse. Next we see him in uh, the the long sermon Jesus gives in Matthew 24 that we spent a long time there. He's the one standing <clears throat> in the holy place that brings in what Jesus calls the abomination that causes desolation. I'll explain more of that as we get further in. Then we saw him in Paul's long description. In, when we went all the way through and tracked through 2 Thessalonians 2, he is called by different names, the man of sin, the lawless one. And finally, the title that all of us know, he is called the Antichrist. Now, it's fascinating. This title that is so popular by prophetic books, you know, the Left Behind books and Hal Lindsey books, you've all heard of the Antichrist, but he's really not mentioned that often by that name. He has 30 other names. Uh, is big in the Bible, but the Antichrist, uh, who is uh, described by John. Well, now in chapter 7, as you look at the prophet Daniel, we see the longest. Now, this is the longest description of this man. This is the most vivid. Now, we're only going to cover one chapter of them, but there, there are many elements that we're going to see in here. And you say, even as I'm going through this, you say, well, why would we even want to know this much about him? I mean, uh, let's talk about Christ. Why would we talk about the Antichrist? Because in this chapter, we find, in chapter 7, we find the perfect reminder from God. As we're going to read, starting in verse 7, in just a moment, we're going to read them. But in Daniel 7, 7, what you find is this horrific, beastly man coming. And all of a sudden, the camera swoops and focuses in on the throne of God. Then the camera goes back in divine scriptures on this horrific beast. Then the camera goes back on Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords descending. Then the camera goes back on how awful the beast is, but then it goes back on God conquering. See, what the Lord wants us to do is to realize that horrible things are going to go on on this planet to the very end. And there's going to be the worst time yet ahead that earth's ever known. But the whole time, those horrible tribulation hours are upon the earth, God is still on that throne. We're going to read about in verses 9 and 10. And Jesus Christ is coming back to right all wrongs. So, chapter 7, verses 7 through 14. Let's stand together with Daniel open, and let's hear God's voice through Daniel the prophet recorded in the Holy Scriptures, and let's invite God to speak truth into our lives through his word, by his spirit. Chapter 7, verse 7. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, 
exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Verse 11, I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, I thank you for such a perspective that you offer to each of us this perspective of your throne in heaven, of the holy, are you Lord God Almighty, being constantly the theme of that, that tranquil spot where you reign over all, that towers over all the machinations and destructions and beasts and kingdoms and death and all the evil on this earth. And sometimes we wonder why you don't just end everything now and get the suffering and sin to cease. But you've told us that you have a plan. It's right here written. And you are sitting enthroned, no less powerful, no less holy, no less glorious because of the mess down here. And what you've asked us to do even in that prayer, Lord Jesus, that you gave us as a framework. You've said that we are to look up and to see you high and lifted up on your throne, and then all of a sudden, earth makes sense. Because it's not us deciding what's happening, it's you. Because you are the Most High who rule over all, and we are your subjects, your children, your servants. And we want to do and live and be and think and respond your way. So teach us that this morning. Teach us to do what you have called us to do, and that is to trust and hope and follow and obey and endure hardness and suffering and living in a fallen, wicked, evil world until you come or call us home. Teach us, I pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. This morning we're about to see one of the facets of, of ministry that, that I most love. How you get from chapter 6, verse 2 of Revelation to chapter 7, and by the way, next week, chapter 8, and the next week, chapter 9, of Daniel. I mean, how can you fit that into the book of the Revelation? Well, I, I want to give you what I call the, the panoramic view of the Bible. Uh, sometimes... Um, in fact, my son is, is uh, helping me as, as we're preparing a, a uh, kind of an online overview of the, the ministry that 
Sunday night I presented uh, here in East Asia. And, and I, I gave him these pictures from which on last Sunday night I had just cut out one little piece of it. And he told me, he says, Dad, that is fascinating that when you showed that picture on Sunday night, he said, I didn't realize what was all the way around it. And I said, well, that's because I didn't want everybody to be distracted. I just wanted them to think about one thing. Did you know that sometimes when we're studying the Bible, we so focus on the one thing that we don't realize that every part of the Bible is part of a much larger, what I would call, a panorama. So basically, the panorama is this. Uh, there is, on every verse of the Bible, the weight of over 31,103, I might add, other verses in the Bible. The Bible is not, uh, you know, kind of like a collection, like the Reader's Digest, you know, remember those condensed books they used to give out where they would just get a little smattering of the book and kind of give you what they thought was the best? No. The Bible was inspired, every single word of it, by God. And there are 31,000 verses. And those verses are a weight. And, and they, to me, uh, they kind of like are a, a pyramid with the ultimate weight uh, pointing downward on every text. Now, there is another way of looking at the Bible, and that is as you study the Bible, there's kind of like this huge foundation underneath you of 31,000 verses, and all of those verses are pointing toward one text. Now, between those two is this, the book of Revelation. Now, I personally, and, and uh, I've never said this on Sunday morning, both of these views are methods of teaching the Bible. Uh, this right here at the top is the text. So this is the text that you're covering. There are two ways of looking at the text. Either you just look at the text and, and acknowledge the fact that it's part of a mass, or you look at the text and feel the weight of all the other verses that God inspired, and many of them deeply impact what that verse is about. Now, this, both of these are expositional or expository uh, preaching. It's where you expound a specific portion of the text and give the literal and historic and grammatical explanation. But within that, there is a textual form of preaching where you just stay with the text and you kind of never leave the book that you're working on and you just kind of work right through the book of Revelation, which makes a real nice, tidy outline. And you just through it. But the problem is you don't have time to talk about the fact that God has immensely spoken about that one topic. For example, here, uh, there are 27 chapters of the Bible that talk about what's in chapter 6, verse 2. And rather than just alluding to those, my heart's desire is for you to understand the big picture of what God is doing rather than the a white horse came and a rider on it, and great, that's good, let's go on to the next horse without understanding how big Revelation 6-2 is. So, with that in mind, there are 27 chapters of the Bible and counting, and this morning we need to pause and think about how many different chapters God used to describe this evil servant of Satan. Why does God go to the extent that he goes to tell us about this man coming? Well, in, in the bulletin you can see tonight, uh, you know, the, the morning service sure does trigger a lot of interesting questions. And, and someone uh, last week as I was leaving, they, they said, wait a minute. And they're all written. They said, wait a minute. If we're talking so much about the tribulation, are we going to be there? Uh, and, and how do we know we're not going to be there? And by the way, can anybody that's alive right now be saved during the tribulation? I mean, these are wonderful questions that, that we're going to have fun with tonight. But John talks about, uh, I mean, Jesus talks about this, this beast coming in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. That's three chapters. And then Paul describes him in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. That's two chapters. John describes him. That's where the Antichrist comes passage comes in in 1 John 2 and 4 and 2 John 1, then Revelation actually devotes from chapter 6 through 20 is all about, he rises, the Antichrist does, in chapter 6, and he's finally placed in the lake of fire in chapter 20. And between those two, there are 15 incredible chapters. And now, right now in Daniel, we see him in Daniel 7, 
Uh, we're going to see him in chapter 8. We're going to see him in chapter 9. We're going to see him in chapter 11. And that's four more chapters. So the worst human who has ever lived already is the subject of 27 chapters of the Bible. Now, that's extensive coverage. You know, when you read the news, when there used to be newspapers, you know, and, and they were like this, you know, you'd see the front and then you'd open it up and you'd look at the whole thing. Do you remember that the law of news was if it was in the top half above the fold, they would call it, it was important news, especially if you read the Wall Street Journal. If it was on the front top half, it was big news. Did you know anything that gets 27 chapters of coverage is on the top of the fold? It's big to the Lord. It's vital. So this worst of all human beings has extensive coverages. And I want you to think with me about a man that has so many different names in the Bible. Why does God call him that man of sin and lawless one? Why, is he, why does he describe him as a beast that is ferocious and horrific? And why is he called the son of perdition? Well, it's for this reason. Satan empowers the, what we're seeing in this man is what the devil can do if God doesn't restrain him. This is a normal human being that becomes a completely surrendered to the devil's control vessel. Now, that should ring a bell because God doesn't allow Satan to do that very often. He allows him to temporarily do that from time to time, but he never pulls the rods out, you know, control rods, you know, nuclear reactors, the, I forget which one now is leaking somewhere in America, you know, we have another nuclear reactor problem flashed across the news. But what they do is they put those rods in to absorb the neutrons to, to slow the reaction down so that there's not too much power being produced by the atomic reaction inside that reactor. Well, God does the same. He restrains the devil. He puts the rods in of his restraint and doesn't let Satan do all he could do. But with the Antichrist, the Lord pulls out and says, you can have unfettered display of malignity through this man. What that does for me, you say, how on earth is that profitable? Did you know that's what God offers every one of us through his spirit? We were having a great talk last night at supper about, we, were, we as a family are reading through, we read through a chapter of Acts at our meals at supper. And we were reading the, the 13th chapter of Acts last night around the table. And everybody was reading their, their section of verses. And one of the questions that came up at the meal was, how was that person in the 13th chapter so bold to do that? And I said, boldness is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, with Satan, God puts control rods in that causes him not to be able to express the power through the person that he wants to because God limits him. Did you know that it's us in our lives that have the control rods and we limit God? God allows us to surrender. In fact, I... I when I came back from uh, speaking, I think at the CMDA, I was telling you that I talked to them about the fact that all of us are like a glove and, and God is like the hand and being full of the Spirit is when the glove of our life is filled by the hand of God and we allow him to, to use us. We're the glove, he's the power and he can do anything as long as we surrender and allow him. But some of us gloves are stiff and some of us gloves are saying, no, no, I'm a gardening glove. I don't do mechanical work. Or, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fancy glove. I, I only do this and that. And instead of saying, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, I surrender to you. That's why the Lord says that, that the very first thing we're supposed to do in that Lord's prayer is to say, thy kingdom come. I want you I want your will, your reign in my life. I surrender. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Because God can do anything. That's why I love missionary biographies. I have over 100 of them on my shelves. I love to read about what happens when a normal human being that is weak and struggling and has fears and has struggles that every human has just says, God, I'm not going to restrain you. What do you want to do through my life? That's why the Antichrist is such an example to us. This guy's normal human being that totally is surrendered to the devil. And he ends up running the whole world. Something Hitler couldn't do, something Stalin couldn't do, something Genghis Khan couldn't do, Alexander couldn't do. Nobody has done it. This average Joe of a guy 
with the power of Satan harnesses all humans under his domain. Can you imagine what an unfettered life can do? Yeah, you can. We know him. Guys like D.L. Moody, guys like the Wesley brothers, guys like George Whitfield, guys like Martin Luther. Those are incredible. And, and the incredible, not so known people that aren't named by missionary biographies that have allowed God to do exceeding and abundantly through them. Well, this man is empowered and he's the worst human ever of all who have ever hated good of those who have ever hated god of those who have hated christians the antichrist will be the pinnacle and when this man appears he pulsates with the power of demons remember the ones that the demons could break the shackles this guy is going to pulsate he's going to flow with the great powers of satan so much that even people's money they're buying and selling even their lives will be at his nod and his snap of a finger he is going to be immensely powerful remember it's jesus who describes the arrival of this guy in fact jesus trusted what we're reading jesus trusted the authenticity of what we're going to see in this this record of daniel we've already studied last time jesus affirmed and authenticated and declared that daniel was reliable and so in Daniel 6, to get the context, if, I mean in Daniel 7, as you look at it, you notice that Daniel is seeing something. Back up to verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head while in bed. And he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Now, Jesus quotes, remember we covered this last time, Jesus quotes, the only prophet he quotes in his sermon on the future is Daniel. So Jesus affirms what Daniel says is reliable. Jesus authenticates and declares Daniel's reliable. And so what does Daniel say? Well, if we stop and check the context of any passage, the context always deeply impacts the interpretation. And what Daniel says is there are four kingdoms that God uses to frame human history. And those four kingdoms, and God shows us only four world empires, started way back in Daniel chapter 2. And so when Daniel has this dream and starts saying in verse 2, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. I mean, just, you know, we're not, we're not going to get bogged down in the book of Daniel, but I'll just tell you a few things. Four winds of the heaven, the word winds in Hebrew alternates. It's the word wind. Depending on the context, it's also used for spirits. And what we see is, this is probably what Zechariah is talking about, that God has four angels that are kind of like always going out into the earth and causing his will to be done with the nations. And so probably these are four winds which are from the throne of God, which are spirits, who are angels, who are stirring up world events to cause what God wants to happen. Now, the great sea always in the Bible is the Mediterranean. So everything that, that is talked about, God says the center of human history is having to do with the Mediterranean world. Now, he doesn't say there isn't an India and a China. He doesn't say there isn't Oceania and North and South America and Africa. But it's the Mediterranean world that's kind of the porthole through which God talks about human history. And so, Daniel saw this Mediterranean scene in verse 3, four great beasts. Now, these are the same four that we bump into in chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar has that dream. It's the same four that we're going to see in chapter 8, and we're going to see in chapter 9, we're going to see in chapter 10. God always talks about human history, not that there were no other kingdoms, but the kingdoms that interacted with his chosen people of promise, the Jewish nation, are the ones that are the focal point. And the first one, Babylon, is the one that stopped Israel from being a nation. 2,600 years ago, Nebuchadnezzar ended the existence of Israel as a nation. It's never existed as a nation, as a sovereign state with their own king totally in control, do whatever he wanted to do for 2,600 years. Nebuchadnezzar stopped that. And Jesus calls that the times of the Gentiles. It's when the Gentiles are ruling the world over his chosen people, the Israelites. And so Israel was dominated by the Babylonians, then by the Persians, then by the Greeks, then by the Romans. But amazingly, 
they became a nation again in 1948. For the first time in 2,600 years, they have a king, a prime minister, a president, who can do whatever they want to do. Fascinating. Well, Daniel 2 already gave us that overview with those four empires. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, the head of gold was Babylon, the silver was the Medo-Persian, the bronze was the Greek, and the iron was the Roman. God shows us he knows all of human history, but he shows his plan in light of the people he chose. Now, this is something for us to think about. God builds his plan of history around the Jews. Now, that doesn't play well. I mean, that is politically incorrect. I mean, most people feel uncomfortable about that. I mean, there's already this idea there's a conspiracy and the, the Jews, you know, are, are you know, they're, they're the power brokers and, and there's always been these conspiracy theories put forward by the devil, I would assume. But the reality is God does have a group of people he chose and made an eternal covenant with that God swore by himself and he cannot break that covenant and it's with the ethnic descendants of the man that was his friend named Abraham the Jewish people it's not I'm not Jewish some of you may be I'm not he didn't make it with me he made it with the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and think about what God has done He's built his plan of history around the Jews and God sends us right here in Daniel 7 a history lesson to show that all of human history is seen and directed by God around the people he chose and called the Jews. And that's, that is what the Bible says. God says the Jews are the ones he used to bring his word the scriptures. I mean, every author of scripture other than a little section that Nebuchadnezzar wrote he wrote chapter 4 with his own hand. That portion of scripture was not written by a Jew, but it was incorporated into Daniel's prophecy. Other than those few little letters that are in the Bible, all the rest of the holy scriptures, as it says in Romans 2, the oracles of God, the voice of God captured on paper only came through Jewish people. That, that's significant. God says the Jews are the ones through which he used to bring his son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the one who sits on the throne of David. He is very much associated with the Jewish people. God says his 12 Jewish apostles are the ones he used to bring the good news of his church. I mean, we are so much into diversity. Why didn't he, you know, diversify his apostles? Why didn't he, you know, throw in some others to make everybody feel welcome? God says, I am sending my word, my son, and the birth of my church. And it's built on the, upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. All are Jewish. All are his chosen people of promise. And finally, God says the Jews are the ones that he will use to ignite the final war that ends human history. So basically, that means that the final Holocaust, you know, there's great interest in the Holocaust and Holocaust museums and the Holocaust themes, you know, and, and there's a fascination with World War II and Hitler and everything. Well, today, God's chosen people are still the focus of most of the world's hatred. Jews have at one time or another been hounded and chased and pogromed and holocausted and driven out of every country they've ever lived in. I mean, you say, well, not here. Oh, yeah? I mean, the, the KKK didn't just hate black people. They hated the Jews. And they, they terribly made them feel unwanted in this country. And, and of course, America wouldn't let in, you know, the refugees and, 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 uh, from Hitler, and we held them off, and so we weren't exactly the most friendly Statue of Liberty, arms open country in the world. But today, the greatest tension our world feels surrounds this simmering Arab-Israeli conflict. The status of Jerusalem. By the way, do you know what Jerusalem becomes? It becomes the Antichrist capital city. He sets up his capital in Jerusalem. 
You see this man, this, this incredible man? And so Jerusalem's status is a powder keg. It seems the fuse was lit in 1948 when the Jews became a nation for the first time since Nebuchadnezzar. And for 2,600 years, the world has waited, but now the powder keg is lit. And Jerusalem is surrounded by these people that there are only 7 million of them compared to 7 billion. There's a thousand, one thousandth of the population of the world are these Jews and they're causing problems for everybody. And they're causing more political heat in the world than anything else that's going on. But everything that God says about Jerusalem and Israel and the Jewish people ends up being tied to one man who God calls this beast. He is Satan's promised one, Satan's Messiah. He is the Superman that Satan sends to deceive the world into thinking that someone other than Jesus Christ can save them from God's judgment on sin. That's what the Antichrist does. That's why he's worshipped. You don't need God. You don't have to worry about his judgment. You don't have to worry about all his rules. Trust me. And people believe him. Okay, Daniel chapter 7. Let's go through this chapter. I call this the pedigree, and, and you can start in verse 8 with me and notice these words, okay? Daniel 7, 8. This is the pedigree of the worst human who ever lives. In the book of Daniel, we have many descriptive titles for this person known in the New Testament as the Antichrist, and here's just a summary of these titles. First of all, he is the little horn, if you see in verse 8, which makes him the greatest power broker politician of all time. One man does what all other kings have tried to do and failed. One man unites the world. Nimrod failed at Babel. Alexander fell at Babylon. The Caesars failed to conquer the pagans. Genghis Khan couldn't take Europe. Hitler miscalculated Britain and America, but the beast subdues the whole world. It says it later on in this text and also says it in Revelation 13 that he has the whole world as one big kingdom that he rules. Secondly, in verse 8, he has the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. This horn has eyes and a mouth. And it's the most brilliant communicator. The world is vexed by the Palestinian issue and Jerusalem and the Arab-Israeli conflict and radical Islam and on and on. But this one man can talk the world into going his way. He seems to win at first just by communicating. And, and the power of communication is very effective with him. In verse 21, he is the ultimate hater of God's people. It says in verse 21, he makes war on the saints and prevails. Now in the book of Daniel, remember the church is, is a mystery that wasn't before revealed in the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel, the saints are the Jewish people. They're the followers of the Most High. They're the ones that have the temple. They're the ones that have the prophets. They're the ones that have the sacrifices. And Daniel is referring to the Jewish people. And so in the tribulation time, the saints are the believers among the Jewish people and those that they, remember they're the evangelists, Revelation 7 and 14 say that 144,000 Jews, ethnic Jews, evangelize. They become the ultimate. You know, we have the crows that go to Ethiopia and many other missionary families. God has his own set during the tribulation. He actually has three sets. He has the two witnesses, he has 144,000, and he has the angel. God has three different mechanisms for sharing the gospel. But this ultimate hater of God's people is the greatest persecutor. Others have tried and failed to extinguish God's people, but God allows the evilest of men to prevail, to martyr, to hound the saints of God, and to almost exterminate believers on the earth. In fact, the martyred saints of the tribulation show up in Revelation 6 and 7, and they're coming up martyrs out of the tribulation. And when John sees them in Revelation 6, he says, what is this countless, innumerable number of people wearing white robes? And the angel said, those are the martyrs that God is allowing the beast to kill. So this, is, this man is the greatest persecutor of all time. He's also the most fearsome warrior. Verse 23 says that he devours the whole earth. He is the greatest and most fearsome warrior 
No one else has been able to conquer it all, but he does. His conquests devour, those are God's words, the whole earth. The last, the biggest, the greatest empire and emperor is the one yet to come. With technology, with God granting him authority and Satan's energizing, he is like a ravenous beast of a man. He conquers humans on the earth. In fact, if you look at verse 23, it says he tramples and breaks everybody in pieces. It's like nobody can stand before him. Militarily, communication, persecution-wise. And finally, this is fascinating. Uh, He twists history and morality and religion. He's the greatest atheist of all times. In fact, there's a little indication, a hint, This man not only goes against every law of God and every hint of righteousness and every reflection of the Creator, but in Daniel 11.37, many, many, many Bible commentators and Hebrew scholars believe that Daniel 11 says that this man is a homosexual. It says he doesn't regard desire for women. That's kind of a tame way of saying homosexuality. So this greatest of atheists... Hates God, hates the Creator, hates any rule, hates any law, hates any custom that God has set forth, and the ultimate being that he revokes what God says his desire is for male and for female. And he is the greatest atheist of all. Okay, now how do you apply that before we go? Look first at verses uh, 9 and 10. Because what in the middle of this horrible guy... Look what it says in verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. The Ancient of Days was seated. And here comes this description of garment white as snow, hair like pure wool. The throne is on fire. It's got moving parts of burning fire. Verse 10, a river is flowing before. Millions, that's thousands of thousands, are, are ministering to him. Hundreds of millions are standing. And in front of him, are these books. And in the Bible, the books are the records that God keeps because he's going to judge everyone by their works. Everyone that comes before his judgment seat. For us, our works that were done in the power of his spirit as his servants will be judged by those and receive rewards. For others, God has a record of every sin every human has ever committed and every time they rejected and ignored and pushed away and wouldn't heed the light that lights everyone that comes into the world. Every time they refused the knowledge through their creation they live in, through their conscience God gave them, every time every lost person pushed God out and went to sin, God's keeping the records. So number one, the Ancient of Days always sits enthroned in glory. Do you catch why this is here? After all these eight verses of beasts and destruction and pompous words, all of a sudden, God says, well, don't get discouraged. Look up. God sits forever enthroned as the Almighty. And what he wants us to do, he wants us to trust him. Towering over all the beasts, the empires, the kings, the armies, the death, the destruction, and all the sin and evil is the scene in heaven. The most high rules. By the way, Daniel says that. In Daniel 4, 17, 4, 25, and 4, 32, the most high rules. And in verses 9 and 10, you see him ruling. Every day, every servant who loves, hears, follows, and obeys the Lord is to focus upward on the Almighty God. That's why Jesus said the first part of prayer is, Our Father, Almighty, enthroned in heaven, sitting on that throne with that river of fire before you. You who art in heaven, we want to hallow your name. We're living in this world of beasts, in this world of death and destruction and misery and sorrow and everything that's going on. And the only way to make it through that world is to trust that God is on the throne. And you say, ah, why don't you... And get rid of my problems because God wants us to struggle through life. All that are godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Part of being godly is suffering. Jesus suffered. We suffer because we bear his name. Second, uh, the, the, the second element. Look at verse 13. 
the Son of Man. And, and look what it says in verse 13. And I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Son of Man, who is that? That's Jesus' favorite title for himself. 81 times in the gospel, Jesus introduces himself as the Son of Man. More than any other title, I'm the Son of Man. Here is his introduction in the book of Daniel. And one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, they brought him near, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all should worship and adore and follow and serve him. Do you, do you know what the Bible says? Right in the middle of this, you know, pompous words in verse 11 and 12 and all the beasts and everything that's going on, on earth, the scene goes back and says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will return in glorious power. He will right all wrongs. Live for him. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the judge. The Father has given all rule and dominion and power and glory to him. He's going to come in the clouds. Every eye will see him. All those who hated and deny him will look for holes in the ground to hide from the fierceness of his wrath. Live for him. Jesus has said that we can redeem from the river of time flowing by us at 60 minutes an hour, we can redeem moments if we will say, Father in heaven, I hallow your name. Rule my life. I want to do your will. Supply me your grace to redeem time. You can redeem time anywhere. My dad used to redeem time as an auto worker at General Motors. Live for the Lord. And everybody in Plant 3 knew that in die tryouts, there was a man who loved the Lord and spoke for the Lord, was imperfect, but lived for the Lord. See, you can, you can live, and you don't have to, you know, we don't all have to cross the ocean. He wants us to live for him right here. He's coming. He's watching. But finally, here's the last point. Uh, and this, this takes Daniel. Uh, look at verse 28. It says this, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly troubled, and my countenance was changed, and I kept the matter in my heart. What's going on? You know what Daniel saw? Sin, rebellion, and all the rebels continue to the end. The earth is not going to get better and better. We are not going to win. We are not going to evangelize the whole world, and finally, that we're going to have the moral supremacy. No, it's not going to happen. God says that it's going to get worse and worse and sin and rebellion and rebels and finally Mr. Superman is going to come, the ultimate atheist, a homosexual probably and a hater of God and he's going to almost exterminate everybody that believes in God. Wow, that made Daniel sick. Well, basically... Sin is horrible. Mankind is mortally infected with rebellion. Satan can deceive and destroy and kill and disrupt, but only to a point. That's why we keep seeing, like we do in verses 25, 26, and 27, we keep seeing that God rules. Christ is going to return. Evil will be judged. Evildoers will be consumed. The saints will serve and obey their king forever. Christ offers to us abundant life. The devil came to kill and steal and destroy, John 10. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life, and not just a little of it, overflowing abundant life. How do we live an abundant life in the midst of a killing, stealing, destroying world? Jesus said it. Do you remember his last moments with his disciples as they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. The cross was looming. Jesus was kneeling and getting ready to pray. And, and as the sleepers were laying their heads down, Jesus looked at them and said, watch and pray so you don't enter into temptation. You know what the lesson for us is? The world is going to perpetually go the wrong way. And the devil is going to deceive. And evil and deception are going to run amok through the, the planet. We're to be watching. We're to be praying. We're to be focusing on our Father sitting on that throne in heaven. His Son who is returning to right all wrongs. His Spirit who wants to live within us and make us like a glove empowered by the very hand of God to accomplish anything if we'll watch and pray and not enter into temptation. You know, as we were finishing up our chapter last night, Bonnie asked me, she said, she said, how could that person do that? And I said, they allowed the hooks of sin through temptation to get stuck in them. And once, 
we don't watch and pray and resist temptation. Satan can get those hooks in, and he can reel us in. You know, my wife reeled in a three-foot pike because it had a little tiny, about one-third of an inch long, little tiny barb stuck in its mouth. Three feet long, a third of an inch did it in. And we reeled that thing in. Watch and pray so you don't enter into temptation. The worst human that's ever lived is coming. But God is still on his throne. Jesus is returning. And we're supposed to watch and pray. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. And as you stand, if you've ever wondered if people can be saved after the rapture, that's going to be an interesting question tonight. If you wonder uh, what the rapture is for, why should, I mean, what's the tribulation for? For us, if we're not going to be here, why is there so much of the Bible about it? There are what I call tribulation survival guide tips that work now to survive the time before the tribulation. And they're all surrounding watch and pray and live a life surrendered to the hand of God and be his be filled with his spirit to accomplish his purpose. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that every verse in the Bible has the weight of the other 31,000 verses pressing upon it because this is an integrated message that you designed from cover to cover. You inspired every bit of it. And the entrance of your word gives light to other parts of your word and it most of all illumines our path. Thy word is a lamp to our feet. Show us how to walk in this dark and evil world in which we live, making a difference, redeeming the time, living with the unlimited power that comes the more we surrender to you. And Father, for some who have not yet surrendered, first for salvation, I pray that they would feel your spirit tugging at their heart that they would repent and turn to Christ and even this morning call out to you right where they're standing right now. And Lord, I pray for our counselors, for the elders and for the tightest two women that are here at the end of the service that if there's someone here that needs to have someone open your word that they would have the privilege of ministry. And as we go, may we go knowing that you're still sitting on the throne and we are your servants. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.